Take your Bibles this morning. Turn to Matthew chapter 18. We are in a series on building the kingdom. Building the kingdom means that we allow the teachings of Jesus to affect every part of our life. In other words, what God values and cares about is what you and I should value and care about. When it comes to who is the greatest in the kingdom, Jesus took a little child. When asked the question, he placed the little child in front of the group of men that were there, the disciples. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you'll never get into the kingdom of heaven. Now I want to stop there and I want to go back to the original text because Jesus says something powerful. He says, unless you become like a little child, you can't even get into heaven. Now, church, we don't fully grasp that, I think, sometimes. And as I studied this and read this and began to develop this message, and part of it was incited by the fact that I knew that we were going to be doing this dedication. I knew we were going to be dedicating these two babies and Carter and God spoke to my heart and said, you've been teaching on the elemental or the first things first. You need to understand that part of being a member of the kingdom of God is that you need to become like a child. Jesus was talking in Matthew 18. He said about that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called the little child to him put the child among them, and he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never, ever say never, never, get into the kingdom. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. You ask Jesus to come into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, and he says, unless you become like a child, you can't even get in. Yeah, but Lord, I don't understand because, well, you know, I was raised children should be seen and not heard. But that's not what it means. Jesus was saying that we need to become childlike, not childish. Yeah. How many know there's a difference between childish and childlike? Yeah. Right? So what is it about this that was so important that Jesus said, look, you need to understand who these people, these little people are. And what are the characteristics of them that make us what we need to be? It was this little child that was Jesus' understanding of the kingdom. Simply put, he said three things. You know, as pastors, we always preach three things. He said we should appreciate their heart and that we should, number one, emulate them. Number two, protect them. And number three, rescue them. Emulate them, protect them, and rescue them. In other words, if we want to be part of the kingdom, we need to become like them, not childish, but childlike. How many know there's enough childish people in the world? There's enough childish people in the church. If you're in church or if you've been in church for any length of time, you know there's a lot of childishness that goes on. There's a lot of things like gossip and, and, and uh, judgment and these kinds of things that happen in the church. And God said, I never called you to that. So what does it mean? What is the difference between childlike and childish? We need to develop that. Number one, we need to develop the traits of a child. Who are they and why should we emulate them? Well, number one, they believe. A child believes. No matter what they believe, if you tell them that a big overweight man in a red suit squeezes down a chimney into millions of homes in one night, they believe. If you tell them that a little person with wings and an infinite amount of money flies throughout the world looking for loose teeth for a one-sided exchange, they believe. Or a tiny elf made out of plastic and cloth lives in their home from Thanksgiving to Christmas Eve and can't be touched or they lose their magic and can move around at night when no one else can see them, they believe. But especially when you tell 
or promise them something and you swear to do it, they believe. When Brody was just a little younger, we talked about golf and one day I told Brody I would take him golfing. Now those are dangerous words to a child. Because a child believes you, amen? When you tell them you're going to do something, they believe you. So that's how it stood for a long time. I would just tell him, well, one day, Brody, we'll go golfing. Well, he got a little older, and he told his dad, Dad, I want golf clubs. Now, I'm not talking about the little plastic ones with the little plastic ball. I'm talking about real golf clubs. And so his dad bought him some golf clubs. So one day I said, oh, Brody, you've got golf clubs. We should go golfing. <laughs> Dangerous words. But I didn't commit. But he would ask me periodically, Papa, when are we going golfing? Papa, when are we going golfing? So one day I said, Brody, next week we're going to go golfing. Dangerous words. Because he believed me. So every day, I would either get a phone call or something saying, Papa, when are we going? When are we going? So we picked a Friday, and we went golfing. Now, I want you to know, if you're a golfer, even an avid golfer, you forget about your golf game that day. Because you're not going for you, you're going for them. And we went golfing, and we've been many times since then. But I tell you that story, church, because they believe you when you promise them. Especially when you tell them this, there's a God that loves them, that Jesus is God's only son, that he lived, that he died on a cross, but he rose three days later, and that now he lives in heaven and can come and live in their heart. They believe when you tell them. The second thing about kids is they have a certain way. Number one, they don't fully care what they look like. They don't care what they look like. When they're little, you can dress them up however you want to, but I guarantee you the world will mess them up. Amen? I mean, they'll get dirty. We had uh, Colton yesterday. We had him for a few hours. He got a, a, some candy. It got all over his little face. He didn't care. If we hadn't wiped it off, he wouldn't have cared. See, kids don't care pretty much what they look like. Doesn't mean they don't want to, that, that they want to be dirty or whatever. It just, just means they don't care. The second thing is they don't worry about how to pay the bills. They also don't, aren't obsessed with success and all that means. They also are not bothered by where they fit in the social status. The other thing about kids is they accept people for who they are regardless of what they look like. And then fifthly, they haven't quite learned how to gossip and become two-faced. They pretty much blurt out the truth. There's a story of a wife who told her friend that she was really glad that her new dress covered up some of her figure flaws and made her look slimmer. Her son piped up and said, that's not what daddy says. <laughs> Mommy, how much is two tons? See, kids will say anything, but they'll always tell you the truth. If you want to keep something from somebody, don't say it in front of a kid. How many know the kid will repeat it? They will tell the truth. You don't have to worry about that. When they get older, they learn to lie, just like, you know, we do. But when they're little, they don't do that. The other thing about children is they're humble. Little children haven't developed the sense of pride that we get later in life. In Jesus' time, children were seen and not heard. They had no power, no means of taking care of themselves, and totally trusted and dependent on their parents. See, God loves a humble and a contrite spirit, but he resists the proud. In Proverbs 8, 13, all who fear the Lord will hate evil. Therefore, I hate pride and arrogance, corruption and perverse speech. See, pride will do four things. Number one, It'll keep you from God. Pride will keep you from God. It'll keep you from investing, or should I say, surrendering your life to Him. Because church, listen, we don't want to surrender to anybody. We want to do it ourselves, right? When one of my boys was younger and we were 
having a discussion. We never argued, we just had discussions. And he was getting ready to make what I felt like was a mistake. And we were in the kitchen and we're having this debate and finally he gets frustrated and he said, Dad, I want to make my own mistakes. And I thought about that. And I looked at him and said, son, you don't have to make every mistake. See, we've lived a little and we've made plenty of them. Mm -hmm. And I want you to learn from my mistakes so that you don't have to repeat the same mistakes. Yeah. How many know that's truth? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We learn when other people are struggling, but sometimes pride keeps us from really learning. The other thing that pride does is it causes division in a house or in a church. I've seen pride divide a whole church. Because, see, we don't want to admit that we're wrong. We don't want to tell people we're wrong, or, or should I say just admit that maybe I don't know everything. Maybe I've made a mistake and I'm, I'm not sure how to get out of this, but instead of just admitting it and owning it, how many know pride won't let us do that? And so we end up dividing a house or we divide a church. Thirdly, pride leads to arrogance. And finally, fourthly, it will enthrone you as God in your own mind. Church, listen to me. God wants to be on the throne of your life. But pride will allow you to think that you're God and that you can do whatever you want to do. I've got news for you. God said, I resist the proud, but I give grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5, 6, in the, way, in the same way you are... Younger must accept the authority of the elders and all of you dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God and at the right time he'll lift you up and honor you. So what does humility do? If pride does all of that, what is humility? Well, it leads us closer to God. It causes us to see ourselves as God sees us. And finally, it puts God on the throne of our heart where he belongs. The second part of what we do when we emulate children is we protect them. God has called us to protect our children. Sarah and Trevor will give their lives to protect their children. I guarantee it. Probably everyone in this room would do the same. Did you, understand, did you know, church, that right now one of the greatest travesties in our nation is not the war on drugs? or alcoholism or anything else that you know it's our children that are being manipulated that are being bought and sold in our nation it's not all around the world it's here it's everywhere children are being trafficked when we had our men's ministry convention this last uh, month one of the biggest issues of that was trafficking of little children it's going on everywhere it's in Brentwood it's in Oakley. It's everywhere. Children are being used and abused. And church, we are called to protect them. Yeah. You as parents automatically want to protect your children. But listen, we need to protect all children. Yeah. That's what God calls us to. Matthew 18, 6. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin... It'd be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Little ones means anyone who believes in Jesus. Did you know that when you first came to the Lord, you were a little one? It doesn't matter how old you were, you were a little one. If you were 10, you were a little one. If you were 50, you were a little one. Little ones just means anybody who first comes to the Lord. Because the Bible tells us that we're babes in Christ. And church, listen. Anyone who intentionally causes any of these who believe in him to turn away from the faith puts themselves in danger. Cause to sin, in other words, lead somebody by example or by word or deed, someone to sin would be in danger of hell. There were two kinds of punishments in the Roman days. There was crucifixion. How many know we just celebrated Easter? So we know what crucifixion is all about. But there was also... A practice where they would take someone 
and they would take a large millstone. There were two kinds of millstones. There was a little millstone that you would use at home to, to grind the grain that you would have. But if you didn't have a lot of money, you had to go to the community grinder. That was a large, huge millstone. In fact, it took a donkey or some kind of animal to go around to grind the mill. That's the millstone that Jesus was talking about. They would take you, fasten you to that, take you out to the deepest part of the sea and drop you alive so that you would go down quickly. Can you imagine being at the bottom of, uh, some, uh, of a pot of water and all of a sudden you realize you can't get loose. You're going to drown. They would do that as one of the cruelest forms of punishment. And Jesus says it would be better for you to have that happen than to cause one of these little ones to stumble and fall away from their faith. Church, listen to me. We need to protect one another. Amen. That's what God calls us to do. I, I need to protect Mike, and Mike needs to protect me. We need to love each other. That's how we protect each other is we love each other. We love each other with the love that Christ has given us. Amen? Amen. See, I don't just love my family. I love everyone. Amen. I love Joey. I love Angie. I love Mike. I love Sandra. I love all of you. And, and I've had the opportunity many times to show you that and prove that to you. I'm here today to prove that to you. That I love you. Part of my love, though, protects you. Amen. Amen. I protect you. I give you the word of God. Did you know one of the ways that we don't protect each other is we allow sin to come into our life and we just stand idly by while somebody is falling. Did you know that God called you and I to pick each other up when we see each other fall? Amen. When I commit sin or when I'm going a certain way, if you love me, you will... Protect me. You'll guide me. Amen. You'll come into my life and you'll say, Pastor, we love you. Dennis, we love you. But you're going the wrong way. Sometimes we think, well, I'm going to love them by just letting them do their own thing. No. If you're going into a pit and I don't reach out and try to grab you, how many know I don't really love you? Right? That's what he's talking about. He's saying, look, we have to protect them. Not only do we protect them, but God already offers his protection. <laughs> Psalm 91, 2. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. Mm -hmm. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. He will protect us from the evil one. He will protect us from his tricks. He'll even protect us from temptation. But listen, we have to put on the whole armor. Amen. We've got to put on the whole armor of God. And finally, listen, he rescues us. And we're to rescue them. We're to rescue the little ones. Mm -hmm. Adeline and Jackson and Carter and Landon. They will always need you to rescue them. How do I do that, Pastor? If, I, if I'm not with them, how do I do that? You pray for them. Amen. Amen. You pray for them. How many will raise their hand and say, Pastor, I will pray for these four kids. If not every day, at least often. Amen. I will pray for this family. And I will pray for these children. Amen. Sarah and Trevor are moving up to Montana. I still haven't beat them up for that, but <laughs> I'll do that later. But we love them. And the greatest way that I can rescue them, especially the children, is to pray for them. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? And ask God to just cover them and protect them and show himself to them. God is a rescuer. In Luke chapter 15, we have the story of the lost sheep, but I won't take time to read the whole thing. Jesus said, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he'll joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. 
And when he arrives, he'll call together his friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. Lost sheep are little ones. We're called by God to rescue the lost. Oftentimes we make our churches clubs instead of hospitals. Church, listen, oftentimes the church should be where the hurting and the sick come. Amen. Because they need healing. They need help. Next week we have Dale Everett coming in and Dale's primary ministry is a healing ministry. He believes in the supernatural healing power of the Holy Spirit. And so he teaches that, preaches that, and then people are touched and healed. It's awesome. And, and if, if you are struggling, if you've got something you're dealing with, you come and, and believe that God can do it, and He will. Amen? Now you say, well, Pastor, we don't need Dale for that. No, we don't. But do you understand there are certain men and women that move in certain gifts? And that coupled with your faith, how many know can cause a miracle to happen? Amen. We believe that, and that's part of the rescue. When we understand that people are going to come to church not for a club or not because it's a party, but because it's a place where we can meet God. Amen. It'll change our life. It'll transform us. It'll make us something greater than we were. You know my favorite time for Easter last week's services? The worship was good, but that's not what I was excited about. The message was Awesome, the videos were great. But that was the important part. What was the important part is when people came to the altar after the services flooded the altar and we prayed for them. I had a pastor friend, I called him, I said, how did, how did Easter go? He said, man, it was amazing. I thought he was going to tell me about how many people came or how big the services were or how many services they had. He said, none of that mattered. He said, what mattered is I had, I'm sure, over 100 people that gave their heart to the Lord Easter Sunday morning. He said, that's all I need. Mean. Church, we get excited about the wrong thing. God has called us to not only emulate children, not only protect them, but rescue them. There's a dying world out there, and it needs Jesus. There was a song that was written over a hundred years ago by a woman by the name of Frances Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby. And I want to read the words to you as I close. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. Weep o'er the erring one, lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Though they're sliding him, still he's waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with him earnestly, plead with him gently. He will forgive if they only believe. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, cords that were broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for the, thy labor, the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer, a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. That's the God that we serve. Amen. I want you to bow your heads for just a moment. That we come to it's a moment in time and all of us or at least most of us in this room have come to that place we have come to the end of ourselves and by that I mean that we've been frustrated by sin in our life we've dealt with things in our life that have troubled us and frustrated us Maybe our own walk. And we come to the point in our life where we say, I can't do this anymore. I was just reading a statistic. Do you know how many people have, have sacrificed their own life just in this last year? Somebody gave me a statistic, I think it's my friend Ron, that said that among teenagers, 
children. The number one cause of death is car accidents. Do you know what the number two is? Suicide. Suicide. What does that tell us about our society? What does that tell us about where we're at? Church, when we're in a place where we feel hopeless, when we're at a, a time in our life when we feel like there's no way out, God said, I want you to become, you Christians, I want you to become like little children. They don't care about status. They don't care about having the newest or the most expensive clothes. They are honest to a fault. And most of all, they believe, they trust. I'm gonna ask you the question with every head bowed and every eye closed. How many of you would say, Pastor? I need to come to that place in my life where that childlike faith kicks in. I've struggled, I've been struggling on my own to do it my way. And I need God to step in and help me. It doesn't mean that you're not saved. It doesn't mean that you've never asked the Lord into your life. Church, it simply means this. That you believe trust like a child in the God who loves you. I had the opportunity, as I said yesterday, one of my grandchildren, I just got, got to spend time with him. And he's at that age where you can just love him. And he'll love you back. Oh, he's busy. But he'll let you pick him up. And he has this little thing he'll do. He'll stand there and you go to pick him up. And if he wants you to pick him up, he'll just kind of put his hands up. Just a little. Not a lot. Just a little. He surrenders. And I reach down and put my big paws around his little waist and I pull him up to me. And the first thing I do, because he's got these amazing little cheeks, you just want to kiss him. So I kiss him. And I always tell him, Colton, you're a papa's boy. See, I did that to my three grandsons. Brody, I taught him that. And Brady, I teach him that right now. In fact, I, I pick up Brady and say, Brady, whose boy are you? And he'll say, papa's boy. Now, he has a grandma, a few grandmas. And they have aunts and uncles, and they have moms and dads. But, you know, I am trying to condition them that they're popping. And you know what's amazing, church, is that's our Heavenly Father. He wants us to be Papa's boys. He wants us, as He puts His hands down into our life, He wants us to hold them up, surrender, and say, Papa, here I am. And He'll pick us up. And if we let him, he'll kiss him, kiss our cheek, and tell us that he loves us with an overwhelming love. See, I want why I tell my grandsons and I did my boys the same way, is I want them to love me as much as I love them. Our Heavenly Father wants us to love him and trust him as much as he loves us. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, how many is room? Say, Pastor, I, I need to become a child in my life. If that's you, do lift your hands over this room. Yeah, yeah. If that's your desire, if that's your heart, would you stand your feet and come on all over this room? Stand your feet. You just simply say, I, I want to be a papa's boy. I want to be a papa's girl. I want my Heavenly Father to know that I love Him. See, I can't love God as much as He loves me, but I can sure try. Amen? Amen. Your son or your grandson or granddaughter, they may not love you as much as you love them, but you're going to try, right? God has a, a work for all of us. 
we're to become like a child. We're to protect them. We're also to rescue them. And that's what he's called us to do. I want you all to pray this prayer with me. Pray it out loud. Mean it with your own. Dear Jesus, I love you today as much as I ever have. And Lord, I'm asking you to allow your spirit free reign in my heart. God, I want to trust you with childlike faith. Childlike faith. Childlike trust. Childlike trust. Childlike belief. Childlike belief. I don't want to be childish. I don't want to be childish. I want to be childlike. I want to be childlike. And God, I ask your forgiveness. And God, I ask your forgiveness. If I haven't been. If I haven't been. Because I've called on your name. I've called on your name. I've asked you into my heart. I've asked you into my heart. To be my Lord and Savior. To be my Lord and Savior. And so now, Lord, I recommend that. So now, Lord, I recommend Help me, Father. Help me, Father. To be the one. To be the one. To reach out to the lost. To reach out to the lost. In the hurting. In the hurting. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may have to <clears throat> go to somebody that maybe they were a babe in Christ. You were a certain way. And that could have caused them to stumble. And you go to them. And you ask their forgiveness. And you tell them that you love them. And that you're praying for them. Amen? Amen. Let them know that they matter. <coughs> when you leave today, if you get a chance, you let Trevor and Sarah know that you love them and that you're praying for them. Let these babies these boys, like all of our kids, be on your heart and on your prayer list. Amen? I, I just, I want to see a whole church full of childlike Christians. Because did you know the more you become like a child, the greater you become in the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we love you. We praise you. God, as we leave this place today, we leave so, Father, believing and trusting that you've got to work for us. And God, the first work is that we become like little children and all that that means so that we can truly serve you. And Father, come into the kingdom. God, we love you and we praise you. Father, I pray a blessing over the Sanford family. And Father, I pray a blessing over this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.